Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. How are you? I hope you all are fine and healthy. Welcome back to my channel. Today, my vlog is part of my lecture in pharmacotherapy one, and it is a part of our preparation in international undergraduate program in Faculty of Pharmacy, Universitas Gadjah Mada. Indeed. I'm not fluent in English, but I encourage myself to try because by practicing, we can learn from the mistake. So please don't be afraid to try. And the topic which will be discussed today is about pain management and headache. I hope you can get a lot of insight from the lecture. Okay, happy listening. And Today, we will discuss about pain management and headache. Well, is there anyone never feel pain? I'm not sure, yeah? Pain is very common and can occur anytime. Okay, we will talk about pain first. In the past, pain was associated with punishment, evil, or magic, therefore, Pain relief is considered to be responsibility of priests, a semen or exorcist using plants or certain rituals and ceremony. And pain itself is derived from Greek language, pion, which uh, means punishment, because the pain is considered to be a punishment. Then, the first theories about the pain came from the Greeks and Romans that state that the brain and nervous system play a role in produ producing pain perception. And also, the philosopher Leonardo da Vinci believed that the brain was the main organ responsible for this sensation. Da Vinci also developed the idea that the spinal cord is also an organ that plays a role in transmitting pain sensation to the brain. In 1664, a French philosopher, René Descartes, described what is known as the pain pathway. And in the 19th century, Pain became a spirit science, which became the way for the de development of pain management science. At that time, people discovered opium, yeah? opium compound like morphine, codeine, cocaine, which can be used to treat pain. And nowadays, we know that a pain actually have survival function by directing the body to provide reflex and a protective attitude against damaged tissue until it heals. So when, if the part of our body feel pain, it indicates that there must be something wrong happen in our body that may be a danger. Yeah, because of damage of the tissue. By feeling the pain, we can then do some protective activity, for example, to avoid the, the cause of the pain. Yeah. What is the definition of pain? Pain is an unpleasant sensory. No one happy with uh, this feeling, yeah, with the pain. And also emotional experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage or described in terms of such damage. So again, that pain is an indicator that there is a damage or there is a something happen with our part of the body, yeah, our tissue. So then we can do such action. How is the pathophysiology? 
Yeah. Based on the duration, pain can be divided into acute pain and chronic pain. Um, acute pain usually occurs in the short time. While chronic pain can occur a year, even in lifetime. And based on the origin, pain is also classified into two kinds, uh, the nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Nociceptive pain is still divided into the two kinds of pain, peripheral pain and visceral or central pain. Peripheral pain is pain which have origin from the peripheral part of the body, peripheral part of the body like skin, bones, joint, muscle, connective tissue, etc. It is generally ac acute and more localized. However, some peripheral pain also can be chronic pain. And then the visceral or central pain, usually the pain is deeper, more difficult to localize the location. So like inside in the uh, abdomen or in the visceral. And um, neuropathic pain is also classified into central and peripheral. We will discuss later about the difference between nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is other classification in the this, this scheme. This scheme saw the classification of pain. Again, there is a acute based on the duration and chronic. The chronic pain uh, usually is long lasting pain and it is divided into nociceptive and neuropathic. The example of nociceptive is like osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis. For the neuropathic pain can be central or peripheral. The example of central neuropathic pain is like post-stroke pain, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, etc. And for the peripheral neuropathic pain, it's like postherpetic neuralgia, diopathic neuropathy. Yeah, this is the chronic neuropathic and peripheral pain. Other kind of chronic pain is visceral, which is uh, occurs in internal organ, like pancreatitis, inflammatory bowel syndrome, etc. And, and other pain is a mixed pain, for example, is like lower back pain or cancer pain, fibromyalgia pain. Yeah, this is the example or this is the classification of pain. So there are many kinds of pain. Okay, now let's talk about how is the mechanism of nociceptive pain. Pain is started by pain stimulation. Yeah, this picture is called pain pathway. As I mentioned earlier, the, the philosopher from France, they described for us about uh, pain pathway. Pain is started with a stimulation. Uh, you know that the most of the tissue and organs are interfaced with specific pain receptor which is called nociceptors yeah and when a stimulus like a chemical or mechanical thermal injury comes it will be converted into nerve impulse in the peripheral primary efferent nerves and then it will be transmitted along the efferent nerves via the dorsal root ganglion and it can then deliver to the brain via ascending pathway so like this yeah when the, there is an impulse uh, come uh, like injury or other stimulus 
they will um, received by a receptor called nociceptor and then transmitted into um, peripheral converted into peripheral nerves to the dorsal root ganglion then go up to a true ascending pathway to the brain yeah and uh, the pain transmission occurs through via afferent nerve fibers or it is called nociceptor fibers which are consists of uh, two kind of fiber myelinated a delta fiber which deliver pain faster and it result in first pain with where the pain feels sharp yeah like a sharp pain and then the second is unmyelinated c fiber uh, this deliver pain more slowly it causes second pain where the pain uh, feels dull and last longer um talking about the pain we cannot avoid to mention about the inflammatory or pain mediators yeah because uh, they are responsible to increase the sensitivity of nociceptor by increasing the sensitivity of nociceptor it can decrease the pain threshold so people feel pain so the example of the mediators are prostaglandin, bradykinin, histamine. These are found in inflammatory pain. <laughs> While um, substance P, CGRP, this is the neurogenic or neuropathic pain mediators. Yeah, yeah. So then when the message arrive in the brain, so we can uh, feel the perception of pain. Yeah pain is felt consciously and then sometimes trigger our response oh or do yeah, like this yeah this is the mediators this picture show the scheme of nociceptive pain nociceptive pain can be triggered by noxious peripheral stimulus or inflammation in the upper side we can see some noxious peripheral stimuli like heat, cold, intense mechanical force, and also chemical irritants can stimulate the nociceptor in the peripheral and the stimulus can be converted into a signal that then and the signal can be transmitted through the sensory neuron and to the spinal cord and then to the brain it will result in pain autonomic response and also withdrawal reflex other stimulus of nociceptive pains is inflammation the inflammation involves several inflammatory cells like macrophage mast cells neutrophil and also involve tissue damage this kind of stimulus also can be received by the nociceptor and then converted into a signal that then is transmitted through the sensoric neuron to the spinal cord and then to the brain it will result in spontaneous pain pain hypersensitivity reduced threshold which is called allodynia and increased response like hyperalgesia. Next is the neuropathic pain. The pathophysiology of neuropathic pain differs from the nociceptive pain, which is not involving prostaglandin. Yeah? We as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in nociceptive pain, the mediators is prostaglandin. While in uh, neuropathic pain, uh, it is not involve uh, prostaglandin. And the characteristic of pain usually lasts longer 
and it is an abnormal sensory input process by the peripheral nervous system or central nervous system. For example, there is prolonged sensitization of peripheral or central nerves or nerve sensitization associated with damage to the nervous system inhibitory central function or an abnormal interaction between the somatic and sympathetic nervous system. Yeah, this is several example uh, the abnormality in the sensory input process in the nerve that can uh, contribute to the occurrence of neuropathic pain. And this kind of pain is usually more difficult to treat. And the patient may experience like burning, tingling, electric shock, such as soothing or hyperalgesia or allodynia. Yeah. yeah, this is the illustration of neuropathic pain. If the previous picture you saw, there is a stimulus here. In neuropathic pain, there is no stimulus at all in the nociceptor. But the problem is in the nerve, peripheral nerve damage may be occurs. So then there is abnormality, then they can send the signal maybe more profoundly and uh, then transmit it into the brain, causing the spontaneous pain or pain hypersensitivity. Yeah, this is the neuropathic pain. The, the problem is on the nerve, not in the nociceptor and not involve the prostaglandin. Yeah. Other interesting kind of pain is functional pain. In functional pain, there is no stimulus here. And also the peripheral nerve also uh, normal. But the patient feel pain. Yeah, the pain is uh, due to the abnormal central processing in the brain. Well, no, it is comparison between nociceptive and neuropathic pain. As I previously mentioned, nociceptive pain is caused by activity in neural pathways in response to potentially tissue damaging stimuli. The examples of the nociceptive pain are post-operative pain, mechanical low back pain, arthritis, sport exercise injury, sickle cell crisis, etc. While neuropathic pain is initiated or caused by primary lesion or dysfunction in the nervous system. The examples of neuropathic pain are post-herpetic neuralgia, neuropathic low back pain, central post-stroke pain, polyneuropathy for diabetic HIV, then trigeminal neuralgia or complex regional pain syndrome, yeah, etc. And between the nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain, there is mixed type pain, which is caused by a combination of both primary injury and secondary effect. Yeah, then we will learn about the characteristic or the comparison between acute and chronic pain. In the table, you can see about the characteristic of a pain, then we will differentiate between acute pain and chronic pain. First, in terms of pain relief, both acute pain and chronic pain is, is very desirable. And then acute pain is unusual to induce or cause drug dependence, while chronic pain is frequently cause drug dependence. Next, the psychological component. In acute pain, psychological component is generally not involved, while in chronic pain, it is often to involve a psychological component as a major problem. How about the organic causes? In acute pain, organic problem frequently is a cause, 
while in uh, chronic pain, organic causes may not be present. And then about environmental and family contribution, in acute pain, it is small, while in chronic pain, it is significant to involve the environmental and family contribution. Acute pain is rarely caused insomnia, while in chronic pain, insomnia often or frequently happen. And the therapeutic goals of acute pain is recovery from the pain, while in chronic pain, sometimes it is not possible to get the recovery, but the important is to make it functional. So the therapeutic goals of chronic pain is functionalization of the organ affected. And the last, depression. In terms of depression, acute pain uh, rarely causes depression, while chronic pain sometimes involve or frequently induce depression. Uh, this is the description of the nerve pain and muscle pain. Uh, as I previously mentioned that the symptom of the of the neuropathic pain is like burning, stabbing, electric shock like, but it is different from muscle pain which is often feel like tenderness, etchiness, stiffness, etc. And it is important to measure the pain intensity because it will affect or it will influence the drug choice. There are several ways to measure the pain intensity of the patient. The most common used tools for measure the pain intensity is a visual analog scale or usually we call FAST. Yeah, uh, if visual analog scale is like a scale, it can be numeric or without number uh, from the no pain to the worst pain. The subject or the patient can be asked to describe their intensity of the pain by saying the number. Like, uh, how do you feel if there is number one to number 10? So which number can describe your pain? Yeah. We can use this analog scale and other type of uh, fast, uh, we can use numeric scale, which is translated into word and behavior scale. And also we can use a visual face scale. Yeah, uh, but the, the most common is a visual analog scale using number. And beside the um, visual analog scale, there is also other way to describe the pain. For example, like in this uh, figure, a patient can choose what kind of pain they feel, like stabbing or burning or pains or needles or numbness or etching. And then in the pain level, uh, they can choose from 0 to 10. This is the description. Uh, 0 means no pain. While one is mild pain, you are aware of it, but it doesn't bother you. But in number 10, for example, is the most severe pain. It, make, it may make you contemplate suicide. Yeah. And also using the pain drawing, uh, the patient can also uh, point where the pain is felt. Yeah, where the pain is felt. They can indicate which sensation uh, they feel. Yeah. 
this is the some way to measure the intensity and also to describe the pain now what is the objectives of pain management there are several objectives of pain management namely first reducing the intensity and duration of pain complaints then the second reducing the likelihood change of acute pain becomes persistent chronic pain then reducing the suffer and disability due to the pain yeah and minimizing adverse reaction or intolerance to pain therapy and improving the patient quality of life and optimize the patient ability to carry out daily activities these are the pain management's objective how is the therapeutic strategy for pain there are two kind non-pharmacologic and pharmacological therapy for non-pharmacological therapy we can suggest the psychological intervention like relaxation hypnotherapy etc and also we can also recommend the transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation for surgical traumatic and oral facial like this yeah this is the way of tense therapy transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation and for pharmacological therapy, we use analgesic. Uh, the analgesic for pain can be non-opiate and opiate analgesic. Other are adjuvant and other drugs for neuropathic pain. What is the principle of pain management? Yeah, there is a principle of pain management where the pain treatment should start with the weakest to the strongest analgesic that's why we have to know the intensity of the pain there are several stages first is stage one it can be treated with non-opioid analgesic or nsids in stage two we can use nsid analgesic plus adjuvant in the stage three where the pain intensity is increased we can use weak opioid analgesic plus nsid plus adjuvant and in the stage four which is high intensity of pain it, it can be treated with strong opioid analgesic plus nsid plus adjuvant yeah as a note the examples of adjuvant are antidepressant anticonvulsant alpha 2 agonist etc for the chronic pain there are a guidance from who which is called the three step ladder it is usually used for palliative care which is a pain management in end stage disease here we can see uh, it is started with step one in the mild pain we can use aspirin or acetaminophen or nsid plus adjuvant this is in the step one mild pain while when the pain is increased or moderate pain we can use we can recommend acetaminophen or aspirin codeine hydrocodone oxycodone dihydrocodone weak opioid analgesic and tramadol plus adjuvant and when the pain intensity is increased to severe pain the drug that can be used are morphine hydromorphone methadone levorphanol fentanyl oxycodone etc plus adjuvant and also can be combined with non-opioid analgesic yeah this is the who three-step ladder yeah the same yeah yeah especially for chronic pain there are some principle in management of chronic pain first by the mode because the pain is chronic 
the oral administration is preferable because it is simple, effective, and convenient for the patient. So the first is by the mode, then by the clock. It means that the use of the analgesic is not only as needed, but regularly to prevent pain after treating it. The purpose of the management of chronic pain is to prevent the pain to come. And so don't use proranata. Don't wait for pain to return. This is the principle of management of chronic pain. And of course, again, by the later, move on to stronger analgesic if the pain is not controlled using this kind of ladder. Yeah. This is the principle of management of chronic pain. And the last but not least is individualized because the pain is very subjective. So then one and another have a different sensation of pain. That's why uh, we should individualize the therapy of pain. Yeah. And what is the medication can be used? There are many NSAID analgesic you already learn in pharmacology and also opioid analgesic. You also already learn about the analgesic in pharmacology. And special for neuropathic pain, there are several classes of drug that have shown efficacy in clinical trial for neuropathic pain. Uh, the examples are topical analgesic like capsaicin, lidocaine patch, 5%, 5%, anticonvulsant like gabapentin, lamotrigine, bregabalin, antidepressant like nortriptyline, desipramine, and also opioid like oxycodone and tramadol. This is, uh, can be used for neuropathic pain. And please remember that NSID is not appropriate for neuro neuropathic pain because it doesn't involve prostaglandin as mediator. So the NSID that act to inhibit the synthesis of prostaglandin cannot be applied for this kind of neuropathic pain. And of course, please consider the safety and tolerability when starting the treatment. Yeah, this is just a additional information about some FDA approved treatment for neuro neuropathic pain like carbamazepine, duloxetine, gabapentin, lodocaine patch, pregabalin for the certain type of neuropathic pain. Uh, after you learn about the analgesic, so there is the recommendation to select the analgesic for the patient to recommend the analgesic. It should be adjusted to the intensity of pain and then adjusted to the patient comorbid condition. For example, if the patient has gastric disorder or allergic or hyper hypersensitivity or asthma or history of cardiovascular or cerebrovascular disease, or history of bleeding, of course, we can recommend the different kind of analgesic based on the patient condition and the safety profile of the medication. Okay, uh, the next topic is about headache. Headache is also the example of pain problem. Yeah, headache can be a primary or secondary complaint. Primary means that headache is the main diagnosis not caused by another disease. While headache is a secondary complaint means that, that headache symptoms are caused by other disease like hypertension, or inflammation, or premenstrual disorder, etc. Many kind of disease can cause headache. It 
this called secondary headache. Yeah. Uh, the classification of headache already arranged by uh, the International Headache Society. Uh, they classify the headache into primary headache and secondary headache. For the primary headache, the examples are migraine, tension type headache, cluster headache, and miscellaneous headache not associated with structural lesion. While for the secondary headache, there are many because this is about headache which is caused by other condition. Headache associated with head trauma, headache associated with vascular disorder, and, and, and etc. You can see from the slide. But today, we only learn about the primary headache, migraine, and tension type headache. A migraine belongs to vascular headache because it involves blood vessel abnormality as a component of the headache. According to epidemiology study, migraine headache occurs in 18% of women, 6% of men, and 4% of children. So most of the migraineurs are women. And the peak prevalence of both men and women is between 25 to 55 years. The hormonal factors may be involved and it can explain why the women suffer more migraines than men. Boys, the boys suffer from migraine at an early onset than girls. And migraine sufferers mostly have a family history of migraine and most also often experience muscle tension headache. So it means that migraine is also like a hereditary uh, disease. Yeah, what is the definition of migraine? Migraine is a chronic condition characterized by moderate to severe episodic headache that lasts four to 72 hours, according to International Headache Society. And in the simple way, migraine is classified into three classifications. Migraine with aura, it is also called classic migraine. It is called for 20% of patients. Migraine without aura, it is called common migraine. It is account for about 80% of the patient. And some Migraineurs may have status migraineus, which not heal itself within 72 hours. And what's the meaning of aura? Yeah, aura is kind of of visual problem. So like this, yeah, bling bling or something. Sometimes like zigzag line or something like this. Yeah, this is the. Example or description of aura suffered by migraineurs. Uh, how is the symptoms of migraine? So the symptoms of migraine varies, varies between individuals and even between the incident of migraine in individuals. There are five identifiable symptoms of migraine. Uh, the first is prodrome. This is the first step, which is like a series of warning, warning before an attack. So the migraineurs sometimes feel like sensation like change in mood, change in feelings or sensation like smell or taste or feeling fatigue or muscle tension. Yeah. This is the first step of migraine, this is called, which is called prodrome. Then it can be followed by aura, the visual disturbance that prior to the onset of the headache. Then the, the third step is headache itself. Generally one-sided, throbbing, accompanied by nausea and vomiting, sensitive to light and sounds. 
develops over four to 72 hours. And after the headache, actually the headache can resolve. So stop of the headache, it, even if untreated, the pain usually goes away with sleep. And the last part of the symptom is post -drum. Migraineers sometimes still feel a sign like inability to eat, inability to concentrate, fatigue, etc. But again, the symptoms is very various between individuals and even in one individuals between incidents. Not all steps are felt by the migraineurs. Uh, we can see from the table, this is the face of the migraine and this is the symptom and this is the time course. Yeah. The prodrome usually hours to days prior the headache with symptoms of anxiety, irritability, euphoria, drowsiness, sensitive to sound, light or smell. And then the second phase is aura. This precedes the headache, develops over 5 to 20 minutes and it can last up to 60 minutes. This is the visual disturbance and like seeing zigzag line, scintillating image, parasthesias and visual field defect, something like that. And then the headache itself occur in four to 70 hours. If the after 70 hours, the headache is not resolved. It is called status migrenosus. The symptom of the headache of migraine is usually unilateral, uh, often in the temple, nausea, vomiting, sensitive to light, smell, and sound. It is worsened with physical activity. And the last phase is post -drum. After the attack, the symptoms are exhaustion and scalp tenderness. Yeah, this is just uh, a description of migraine. Okay, how is the pathophysiology of migraine? Migraine is always triggered by something or some, uh, it is called a migraine generator or migraine triggers. And it is important to know that the triggers of migraine is very individual between person, between patient. Some may be triggered by environmental exposure, but other may be triggered by hormonal or emotional, something like that. It will cause the occurrence of cortical spreading depression like this. And then can trigger the occurrence of vasoconstriction intracerebral. The vasoconstriction intracerebral can cause the decrease of cerebral blood flow to 75 to 35%. And, and simultaneously, the platelets will aggregate, releasing serotonin. You know that the blood vessels in the head are innervated by serotonin receptors and serotonin itself is a vasoconstrictor that's why when the serotonin is released by the platelet it can cause vasoconstriction and if there is a large brain blood flow obstruction it can induce ischemia so the aura occurs so when the Cerebral blood flow decrease is high, so the aura happen. The aura happen, but when the cerebral blood flow decrease is less or only a little, so no aura occurs. After the vasoconstriction, the subsequent occasion 
is the activation of the trigeminal system. Trigeminal nerve is activated and cause the release of various vasoactive neuropeptides like substance B, neurokinin A, CGRP, which cause vasodilation and plasma extravasation and also neurogenic inflammation and all cause the headache. So in that time, the headache is felt or suffer, which is unilateral and throbbing. The headache occur when the vasodilatation happens. And then the subsequent event is the stimulation of hypothalamus that induce photophobia and phonophobia and the stimulation of chemoreceptor trigger zone which is caused nausea and vomiting. Yeah, this is the overall pathophysiology of migraine. There are several triggers of migraine, psychological factors, environmental factors, food factors, medicine, hormonal factor, lifestyle factor, etc. Again, as I mentioned earlier, that the trigger of migraine is very individual between migrainers or sufferer. Yeah. And some people may have several kind of triggers yeah, to trigger a migraine attack. And how the migraine is diagnosed? It is diagnosed uh, based on the clinical symptom and patient history. So the patient is expected to have like a migraine diary to record the time, intensity, triggers, and also the duration of the headache. Migraine without aura is diagnosed when at least is, there are five attacks with certain characteristics like develop over 4 to 70 hours, which characteristic of unilateral, throbbing, moderate to severe intensity, and may increase with physical activity. And some patients may experience nausea and or vomiting or photophobia or phonophobia. How is the therapeutic goals? of the migraine. The therapy of migraine aims to relieve the symptom or the pain at the time of the attack as abortive therapy and to prevent the attack as prophylactic therapy. So there are two kinds of therapy for migraine. The abortive therapy to cure the attack and to prevent the attack as prophylactic therapy. So the long-term therapeutic goals are reducing the frequency of severity of attack, reducing patient disability during attack, improving the patient quality of life, preventing the next attack, avoiding the increasing use of drugs, and also educating patient to be able to manage the disease. Yeah, this is the classification of the migraine therapy, the acute or abortive therapy, which is taken when the migraine is experienced and treat pains and other symptoms after the attack has begun. While for the preventive or prophylaxis therapy, it is taken on a daily basis to reduce the frequency and intensity of attack. Yeah. Uh, beside the medication, we can use also the non-pharmacologic therapy. The most important is to approach the behavioral lifestyle. And this involves the behavioral changes like limit caffeine or other triggers, reduce stress, exercise, regular sleep, counseling or psychotherapy, biofeedback relaxation, uh, eat regularly, don't skip meal, etc. This is several way to prevent and cure the migraine. But if it doesn't work, of course, we should use the medication. And the, again, as I mentioned before, 
the migrant treatment is classified into two the prophylaxis therapy and acute episode or for abortive therapy and the acute therapy still is still classified into the non-specific treatment and specific treatment the non-specific treatment include nsid and antiemetic if necessary and for the specific treatment is focus on the migraine uh, like using tripton and dehydroercotamine and for the prophylaxis therapy there are several class of drugs that can be used for the prophylaxis of migraine they are beta blockers calcium channel blockers tricyclic antidepressant and anticonvulsant yeah it is interesting because there is no analgesic yeah to prevent the migraine we use no analgesic but other class of drug yeah then we will discuss a little bit about the medicine for abortive therapy again we can use mild analgesic like aspirin parastamol nsid aspirin uh, 900 milligram is recommended ibuprofen we can use for 100 milligram and other NSAID can be used also for the treatment of acute migraine while for the parastamol or astemonophen we need about 1000 milligram because uh, the intensity of the migraine pain usually is moderate to severe so if only use the parastamol 500 milligram is it not adequate and the other class of drug which is a specific treatment is the triptan class in indonesia we have the suma triptan with several doses uh, this is specifically bind to the serotonin 1d receptor as agonist and it causes vasoconstriction so uh, remember that when the headache occurs the condition is vasodilatation so we need vasoconstrictor so because the the blood vessel in the head is innervated by the serotonin receptor that's why we use the agonist of serotonin receptor like triptan it can also inhibit the release of tachykinin so it can block the neurogenic inflammation oral triptan are recommended for acute treatment in patient with oral severities of migraine if the previous attack have not been controlled using simple analgesic yeah this is the several form of triptan uh, the oral use oral administration injection and also nasal spray but in indonesia we only have the sumatriptan in oral administration yeah here the mechanism of the triptan when the the during migraine there is a neural activation cgrp degranulation and also blood vessel dilation when the triptan is applied so it can inhibit the, the granulation and also facial dilation is also inhibited so then return to the normal so it can relieve the pain other drug are ergotamine or dehydroergotamine that can block the neurogenic inflammation by stimulating presynaptic serotonin receptor and sometimes we can use IV administration for severe attack sometimes it is combined with caffeine for example like this one yeah cafergot this is ergotamine tartrate combined with caffeine and the other drug is metoclopramide this is for 
preventing nausea and vomiting if necessary. It is given 15 to 30 minutes before anti-migraine therapy and can be repeated can be repeated after four to six hours. Yeah. Uh, how about the migraine prophylaxis? Migraine prophylaxis is recommended on, in those who are the frequency of migraine attack is more than two, week, two days a week or more than eight days a month. And if they also already use the drug for acute therapy more than two days a week. The attacks of severe headache persist despite aggressive intervention has been done. Uh, use an abortive drugs more than once a month. And presence of a prolonged aura, complex aura, migraine induced stroke. So if uh, it happened, the migraineurs or the migraine sufferer can ask migraine prophylaxis or they are contraindicated or experience side effect with acute therapy and the patient themselves wish to reduce the frequency of acute attack so it can be recommended to them yeah before we learn about the drug to prevent the migraine attack, we should know the general principle for preventive treatment for migraine. For the preventive treatment for migraine, it should be titrated slowly to an effective or maximum dose in order to minimize side effect. And the preventive medication should be given a trial of at least six to eight weeks following dose titration. And the choice of the preventive medication should be guided by their side effect profile and the patient comorbid condition. After six to 12 months of effective prophylaxis, the gradual withdrawal should be considered. Yeah, this is the general principle for the preventive treatment for migraine. Uh, these are the drugs or pharmacologic agent for migraine prophylaxis. This is um, according to American Academy of Neurology. They released some information about the several class of drug that can be used for migraine prophylaxis. And this is the evidence where the level A means uh, there are established efficacy, which is supported by more than two class one trials. Level B is probably effective. Level C is possibly effective. Level U and other mean that this is not supported by adequate evidence yeah if we can see from the table so the level a the example of the drugs in level a are divalproate sodium sodium valproate topiramat metoprolol timolol propanolol frofatriptan and also in level b we can see we see amitriptyline, venlafaxine, atenolol, nadolol, and several triptans. Yeah. For the level A and B, we can see the drug class are anticonvulsant, then beta blocker, antidepressant, and also triptan. Yeah. This is the choice of the pharmacologic agent for migraine prophylaxis. And we have to consider the comorbidity of the patient when recommend the drug choice of migraine prophylaxis. For example, if the, the patient have asthma, so the beta blocker, especially for the non-selective beta blocker, should be avoided. Also in diabetes, bradycardia, 
So don't use beta blocker as preventive migraine when the patient have this condition. But it can be used when the patient have comorbid anxiety. And other example, tricyclic antidepressant. It should be used with caution or can uh, should be avoided to in patient with angel closer glaucoma. While if the patient have depression, comorbid depression, or tension type headache, sleep disturbance, the tricyclic antidepressant is preferable or is preferred because it can also used for treating this comorbid. Yeah, this is the the principle of drug choice in comorbidity. Yeah, this is just an algorithm of migraine prophylaxis. So when the, there is a need of migraine prophylaxis, we can recommend to choose one medication by considering the comorbidity and relative contraindication like this. Yeah? Amitriptyline is preferable in depression but not in mania. Propanolol is uh, is preferable for hypertension, but no for asthma or depression, etc. And please remember that a full therapeutic trial of migraine prophylaxis may take two to six months. And if no efficacy, we can increase the dose, but if no efficacy at maximal dose, we can try the different conventional migraine drug. And then again, we can consider a combination of the two drugs when the efficacy is not achieved. Yeah. And also we can try with alternative agent. Yeah, this is the algorithm of migraine prophylaxis. And the recommendation for preventive therapy is a propanolol, topiramat, sodium valproat, also metoprolol, propanolol, yeah. It, can be used for the migraine prevention. And how they work, it is interesting because they belong to different class of drug, but they can be used for the prophylactic of migraine. The important thing is that the all class of drug can inhibit or prevent cortical spreading depression. That's why this kind of drug can be used for migraine prophylaxis. Next, we will talk a little bit about the tension headache because the tension headache is also very commonly found in uh, our society. And we should understand the difference between the migraine and tension type headache. If the migraine headache involving the vascular, the tension headache doesn't involve the vascular. Instead, they involve the muscle tension. So it is called tension headache. Yeah, this is the most common headache. The prevalence is about 97% of men and 88% of women can start at any age and um, twenty-five percent of patients also suffer from migraines. Yeah, this is the statistic of the headache, and or the cause is mostly muscle contraction of the head, muscle contraction in the head with constant dull pain and an uncomfortable feeling of pressure in the neck, temples, forehead, or around the head. Yeah, the neck feeling stiff. Yeah, and the difference with the migraine is that the tension headache occur bilaterally. Yeah, while in migraine headache is unilateral, can be episodic or chronic. Yeah, this is the area that often suffer. Uh, tension. The, for the tension type headache, the management of therapy is classified into non-pharmacologic therapy and 
pharmacological therapy. For the non-pharmacological therapy, we can do it, we can do the massage, relaxation, uh, stretching, changing uh, in sleep position, yeah, and adjustment in environment and working, etc. So it may help to reduce the headache. But uh, if it doesn't work, we can use pharmacological therapy using the analgesic, the simple analgesic like uh, aspirin, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, naproxen. And sometimes it is combined with caffeine to enhance the analgesic effect. For chronic headache, a more thorough assessment of the cause is needed, for example, due to anxiety or depression. So then if there is other comorbid, so we can recommend the antidepressant to reduce the anxiety or depression. But the important is avoid chronic analgesic use because it can trigger rebound headache or medication overuse headache. Okay, thank you very much. We now finish our topic today and please read carefully the, the materials and please ask when we meet in the synchronous meeting. Well, thank you very much for listening to my lecture. I hope you can understand what I explained and also get a lot of information from the lecture. And please don't be afraid to ask me any time when you have question about the lecture. And see you in the next vlog. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.